On Thursday night, uh, when John MacArthur gave the keynote address, he apologized at the beginning of that message by, because he's known all over the country, all over the world, for his expository preaching, and he said, tonight, if you will forgive me, I'm going to give a topical message. And the reason for that is this, that this is a teaching conference. This is not the same thing as preaching in an ex expository manner, although sometimes we do that at these conferences. But our speakers were assigned topics to give a, uh, an explanation of rather than texts to expound. Now, my topic this morning is on the immutability of God, as I've been trying desperately to save something to say from my colleagues in the Q&A time. In fact, I just talked about the mutability of sprawl. I might just change my mind and speak on something else altogether, but I'm going to go ahead with this. But I have to say also by way of preface that there are literally hundreds of texts in Scripture that could be used as, as our basis for exploring the doctrine of the immutability of God, but I have chosen one that at first glance may seem to have nothing whatsoever to do with the immutability of God, but I hope with God's grace I'll be able to weave in at some point its application and significance to the topic. One more word of preface before I read that text. One of the things I remember about my high school graduation was that part of the agenda at the graduation ceremonies was the valedictorian address. And I remember that particularly vividly because I didn't give it. <laughs> I barely missed it by 155 places. <laughs> Since I graduated 156th in my class. Now, that wouldn't be bad if it was a class of 10,000. But since it was a class of 157, <laughs> I had not much of which to boast. But the, uh, the writers and translators of the New King James Version of the New Testament supply for us and for our benefit uh, headings, chapter headings, and section headings of various passages in the text. And I'm interested at the end of Paul's second letter to Timothy, there is a heading added by the translator that is, says this, Paul's valedictory. That is, the translators are looking at the last portion of 2 Timothy as the valedictorian address of the Apostle Paul. Now, we think of the valedictorian as the person who's first in his class. And if anybody ever qualifies as valedictorian among the saints, it's the Apostle Paul. And so I'd like to turn your attention this morning briefly to the Apostle's valedictorian address. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica 
Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I've sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus of Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. He who has ears to hear the word of God, <clears throat> let them hear it. And let us now turn our attention to this last attribute that we will examine, which is by no means not the final attribute that we could be examining with respect to the being and character of God. But we're looking at the doctrine of the immutability of God. It's stated in negative terms. It simply means, with the prefix im, that God is not mutable. And mutable here has to do with change. To say that God is immutable is to say that He is unchanging. He is what He is always and forever. Now, let me first say what immutability doesn't mean. It does not mean immobility. It does not mean that God is static, that God is paralyzed, that God is eternally in a state of inertia, and it remains something like Aristotle's God, who is likened to the king of England who reigns but doesn't rule. For Aristotle, God is the unmoved mover. He is perpetually inert. That's not what we mean in biblical Christianity about the God of Christianity who's a God who is active, a God who moves, a God who moves over the water, who moves over Israel, who moves over the nations. He's not paralyzed because of his immutability. But what do we mean then by his immutability. Now, some of the references that I want to look at with respect to this idea are these. First of all, immutability refers to God's changeless being. In evolutionary philosophy, everything in the created world is given to mutations. In fact, our present existence are explained by the secularists and naturalists in terms of mutations. Well, there are no mutations in God. As we labored the other day, God is pure, absolute being. In Him there is no becoming. He is pure actuality. He has no potential left finally to be realized at some future point. His being never changes. Now, we would think that that's a rather elementary principle in the Christian uh, faith, but if you turn on Christian television, 
for five hours, I guarantee you, you'll hear somebody teaching an idea about God that has God's very nature, his very being, undergoing change. I remember an occasion, I know, I can't say I remember it because I just was told about it. I wasn't there, and so I can't remember it, but I remember somebody telling me about it just the other day where my mentor, John Gerstner, was at a conference, and the people began to sing a popular, well-known hymn, and he jumped up, called time out, said, wait, 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 wait. You can't sing that, he said. And he pointed to the heretical words of the hymn. Now, Bob Godfrey's talked to us about the beauty of singing the Psalter because in the Psalter we have the unadulterated Word of God, and as much as we love some of the great hymns of the church, that they were written by uninspired people does not guarantee that they are free from error, and sometimes we find gross error, even heresy, communicated in our hymns, and so we need to be careful about what we sing when we are honoring and trying to honor God with our worship. And the reason I, I, I respond to this story that somebody just told me the day before yesterday about Dr. Gerstner jumping up at a conference was it was so existentially meaning to me because I came this close Thursday night to standing up here while we were singing and saying, wait a minute, folks. I don't want to offend a hymn writer by suggesting that we change the words of his hymns, but since Mr. Wesley is enjoying the felicity of heaven today and any of our uh, transgressions against the integrity of his hymnody will be not bothersome to him at all, I would like to suggest some changes to one of my favorite hymns. And can it be that I should gain? Now, not only does this problem that grates me occur once in the song, but it's integral to the refrain. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Boy, that is amazing. It's an incredible thing to contemplate the death of God. Ladies and gentlemen, God did not die on the cross. God cannot die. Now, if I can justify this language in him that he, it'd be like this. We say, whatever can be ascribed to, to one nature of Christ, to the divine nature, to the human nature, can equally be used to describe the person. And certainly, the one whom we embrace as God incarnate, the one who is the God-man, died on the cross. But he died touching his human nature not his divine nature. Think for a moment, just for one moment, of what would have happened that day in Jerusalem had God died. Well, first of all, if God died, Jesus would have died, of course. Pilate would have died. Caiaphas would have died. Mary, watching it, would have died. John would have died. The disciples would have died. Not only everybody in Jerusalem, but everybody in the world would have died. It would make 9-11 look like child's play. Had God perished in that moment, not only would every person in the world die, but the cross itself would vanish into oblivion, and the hill of Calvary upon which the cross was planted would have been vaporized. Jerusalem would have disappeared along with the rest of the world, the moon, the stars, and every planet, because everything that is in the universe lives and moves and has its being in the being of God. And if God's being ceases, 
Everything's over. So please, to keep ourselves from thinking that, I suggest that when we sing this song, we just make one little change. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my Lord, should die for me? Then we escape theopatiatism, patropatianism, and all the rest of these pernicious heresies that are communicated. One other thing in the, in the, in the, in the song. Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. That's a whale of a mystery. <laughs> I mean, if the immortal dies, he no longer can be qualified to being called the immortal. Because immortality means the inability to die. Rick, the non posse mori. No. The mortal man, Adam, the new Adam, the human nature, dies. Now, I know some of you, particularly you Lutherans, are out there thinking that you're listening to Nestorian. Right. How can you separate the human from the divine? I can't separate the human from the divine. We must never separate the human from the divine, but we must distinguish between the human and the divine. When our Lord Jesus Christ weeps, these are not divine tears. They're human tears. When he thirsts, when he hungers, at that point he's still God incarnate, but thirst and hunger are manifestations of his human nature, not of his divine nature. And you say, well, how were the, the two related at the, at the time of the death? Well, the divine nature of Christ is still incarnate when Jesus dies. Prior to his death, the Logos is perfectly united to a breathing, living, human man. And when that breathing, living, human man dies, the Logos is still perfectly united to it. The only difference is that now the Logos is united to a human corpse. But the being of the Logos doesn't change good people. I'm getting excited about this. <laughs> because this would be the mutation of all mutations to have the being of God pass into death. Now, where else do you see it? One of the worst heresies of the 19th century is called the Canotic heresy, based on the hymn that Paul uses in Philippians chapter 2 when he says, have this mind in you which is also among have this mind among you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, took his equality with God, not as something to be grasped, not as something to be tenaciously, jealously held on to, but he did what? He emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant, a man, and becomes obedient even unto death. Wherefore, what? God hath highly exalted him, and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow, every tongue would confess that he is Lord to the glory of God forever. Now, 19th century liberals said that what happened in the incarnation was that God laid aside his divine attributes, either all of them or some of them, and became human. He stopped being God. He emptied himself of his deity. Do you understand that? You hear this on Christian television all the time. God lays aside his omniscience. God lays aside his omnipotence. God lays aside this attribute or that attribute at the time of the Incarnation, because he empties himself. 
The great theologian B.B. Warfield said, the real kenosis is going on here by those who teach such ridiculous things about the character of God is the emptying of the brains from the minds of the theologians who espouse it. It's not that God subtracts something from His deity when He takes upon Himself in this union a human nature. There is no mutation in God. We talked about this with open theism. We talked about this with middle knowledge that, you know, people start talking about God's decision to limit his knowledge. It's a self-limiting thing. It's a self-limiting thing. So God decides to stop being God. God decides to have a mutation in his knowledge. Please, this is why we need to study the doctrine of God, ladies and gentlemen, so that we don't start thinking like this. No, the immutability refers to the constant, eternal, everlasting, unchanging nature of God himself. Now, the second thing we say that doesn't change is his character, which is probably the most comforting thing about immutability, yet at the same time, from another perspective, the most disquieting. And since it brings both quiet, quieting and distress to us, I'm going to leave that for the moment and come back to it, God willing, in a few moments. And just simply move quickly then to another way in which God does not change. He doesn't change his mind. Now let's think about that for a minute. Now you say, well, wait a minute, R.C. We read the Bible, the Bible, the theologians can construct one hypothetical view of God, but we've got to develop our view of God from the Bible. And we look at the Bible, and we see in the Old Testament that God gives rules to the people of Israel about keeping kosher, and they're not allowed to eat certain foods, and these foods are declared to be unclean. And then we come to the New Testament, and all of a sudden, to Peter, the Lord reveals that that which was unclean is now clean, and God has changed the rules. He's abrogated certain aspects of his law. Well, that makes it tough for the theologians, so we come up, always have the thing we fall back on as theologians is the right to make distinctions. If women have the inherent right to change their mind, theologians have the inherent right to make distinctions. So we make it distinguish between God's natural law and His purposive law. Don't confuse this with what we call natural law theories with respect to ethics. When we talk about the natural law of God, we're talking about those laws that God legislates based upon His changeless nature. Which laws, if ever abrogated, would do violence to the character of God Himself. When in the Old Testament God prohibits idolatry, there can be no set of human circumstances in redemptive history where the God of pure holiness would now sanction idolatry because it would be acting against His eternal, unchangeable nature. Do you see that? Now, Dietary laws have to do with his historical program for his unveiling of the purposes of redemption, and at one time it may be useful for him to restrict the eating of certain things, where later, as his glorious work of redemption is unfolding, he removes that sanction. In doing so, whether we eat pork or don't eat pork has nothing to do 
with the everlasting, eternal, immutable character or nature of God. Do you see the difference? You say, well, even worse, we have these things that we brought up at the Q&A about all these times we're reading the Bible where God says he's going to do something, and then people plead with him, oh, don't do that, or Abraham intercedes, or Moses intercedes, and then in the narrative we read, and God relents. He changes his mind. Even repents that he even made man in the first place. Doesn't the Bible talk like that? This is what the open theists are telling us all the time. Hey, wait a minute, you've got to be faithful. The Bible talks about God changing his mind constantly. I said, yes, it does. What do we do with it? We cut those passages out of Scripture. <laughs> or else we listen to the Scripture and listen to what the Scripture says we should do with passages like that. Again and again and again, the Bible describes God in human terms. Why? It's the only terms we have to communicate. And so it speaks of the right arm of God with respect to his power. It says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But we know that that's metaphorical language, don't we? That's clear. We know that the Bible is not trying to tell us that God is some transcendental, heavenly, cosmic cowboy who's in the cattle business and every now and then has to go down to the OK Corral and have a shootout with the devil who was a rustler from the beginning. No. That God owns the cattle on a thousand hills is a human way of describing the vast riches that our Creator possesses all. Corey Ten Boom used to pray on the basis of that text. Her name's Ten Boom, too. All you Dutch people know that. The Americans call her Ten Boom, like she was part of the Big Bang or something. But Corey, Corey Ten Boom used to pray in times of deprivation of her people during the occupation, Oh, Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hills, so would you please sell one of them and give us the proceeds so that we can eat? But this language is perfectly useful to describe God's activity among us. But when the Bible uses human language to describe God, particularly in the narratives, the didactic portions of the Scripture give us the corrective, not a corrective in the sense of correcting an error, but a corrective in the sense of qualifying the meaning of the text, lest we fall into serious trouble. Even though the Bible says that God relents, even though it says from time to time that he repents, it goes on to say, but remember, remember, God is not a man that he should repent. That's what the open theists have forgotten. They don't remember it. They forget it. The Bible itself warns us not to push the envelope on this human metaphorical language about God. Now, think about God's changing his mind. People ask me the, the spiritual question, can prayer change God's mind? The short answer to that is this, to ask such a question is to answer it. How could a prayer change God's mind? Not only do I teach and preach and minister, but I also have administrative responsibilities for a rather large organization, and as an executive of that organization, as all executives are, they're responsible for managing the resources because we know a dollar spent here is a lost opportunity of a dollar over here. And so we're called to be good stewards and to make wide decisions with the use of our equipment, our personnel, our finances, and all of those things that are part of our resources. And so as a manager, what do I ask my staff for all the time? Information. 
I don't want to make decisions pertaining to the kingdom of God on, by the seat of my pants. Because the more data you have, if it's the right data and the important data, the decisions jump out at you. And that's what we're told to do as stewards, is to examine the data, because we're prone to making mistakes. And I don't know how many times in our ministry I've come into a board meeting or come into a, a staff meeting and say, well, here's what I think we ought to do. Here's my plan. And Tim Dick or one of our other executives will say, well, R.C., have you considered A, B, C, or D? Well, no. Well, here's where we are with A, and here's where we are with B, and here's where we are with C, and here we are with D. And I said, oh, I, I didn't, didn't realize that. Thank you for pointing that out. I think we better change the plan. You see, that's how we operate, isn't it? The best coaches in football have game plans for their encounters. And if things aren't working in the first half, they make adjustments in the locker room at halftime, and they move from plan A to plan B. God doesn't have a plan B. You see, do I think that I can say, well, God, I know you're planning to do this, but have you considered? <laughs> let me be your guidance counselor. Let, <clears throat> let me give you some facts that maybe you, you weren't aware of when you made this decision. And in my prayer, God benefits from my instruction. I teach God things that he didn't know before I pray. Is there anybody in this room that would ever think that they can teach the Almighty anything that the Almighty doesn't already know. We've already talked about, well, what we call omniscience, but what my friends who read the Psalms calls omniscience. There's no new information for God that we can give him. Well, maybe he had all the information, but his intentions were a little bit defective, a little bit bordering on the unethical, until in our prayers, we reprove him and persuade him not to do this bad thing that he was planning to do. Would anybody dare stand up before Almighty God and say, I told you not to do this? Prayer, if you ask me, does prayer change things? Yes. Does God use prayers to, as secondary means to bring his work to pass? Yes. Does God not only invite us to pray, he commands us to pray? Yes. Does he say the fervent effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much? Yes. It avails all kind of things. The one thing it doesn't do is change his mind. Because God has never had to change his mind from the foundation of the world. So let's not think of our God as a God who goes from plan A to plan B to plan C, corrects this, corrects that, Whoops, I'm sorry, because of our instruction. Quickly, I mentioned that immutability is at once a blessing and a matter of great distress to us. We heard a brief synopsis in the recitation of Max McLean of the famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an angry God. And we have a difficult time relating to the idea that God is a God of wrath, and we have indeed, as Ligon has suggested, muted the biblical teaching of the wrath of God in the life of the church today. <coughs> but not only have we muted the idea of the wrath of God against us, but there's a concept that's all but disappeared from our preaching that's at the center of the biblical revelation of the human condition. When the Bible says that we're sinners, that we're fallen, and that we're corrupt, at the heart of our corruption, and at the heart of our heart of that corruption, is our natural enmity and hostility 
to the true God. And one of the things that Edwards looks at frequently in his sermon is, he, is this whole business of why it is we are enemies of God. Why it is that by nature fallen creatures hate God who is so altogether lovely. Why would a creature hate a God who gives him every gift that he has in whom he lives and moves and has his being, who gives him life itself? How would you hate the one who does that? Well, Edwards speculates on this, and he says there are basically four things about God that human beings just can't stomach. The first thing they hate about God, we've already looked at, and it's this, God is holy. And we are not. And if there's anything unholy people hate with a passion, it's pure holiness. Go back to your high schools, go back to your colleges. When you had a very difficult test, and you didn't do very well on it, Teacher passes out the grades. You look at your grade, 65. Your neighbor gets 70. The other person gets 54. And everywhere you look, everybody's making Ds and Fs, right? So what hope is now going to blossom in your soul? The teacher's going to do what? Grade on a curve. And then the teacher stands up and says, there are 30 people in this class, 29 people scored 71 or less. But Virginia Johnson, you scored 98 on this test. And I want to congratulate you because you've proven that I did not make this test too hard or unfair and all the rest. And so everyone else in the class gives Virginia a standing ovation. No. They hate her because she broke the curve. Who was it that hated Jesus most fiercely? But those who had been embraced as the paragons of virtue, the standards of human righteousness in their community, but they were <clears throat> phony. They were counterfeit. But nobody saw the counterfeit righteousness of the Pharisees until the genuine showed up. And when the real standard of holiness stood in their midst, they were gnashing their teeth. They couldn't stand it. They had to do away with him because by nature we hate the holiness of God. Well, what else do we hate? Edward says, second thing we hate, is God's omniscience. Why? Well, if God is holy and I'm unholy, maybe I can get away with being unholy by confining my unholy behavior to those secret places in the darkness where God will never catch me. Like Adam and Eve, I'm going to hide in the bushes because I don't want God to look at me. I want God to overlook me. Jean-Paul Sartre used this image. He saw God as a cosmic voyeur looking through a keyhole, a peephole from heaven, down upon us, you know, making a list and checking it twice. Always we are beneath the gaze and scrutiny of God. And Sartre said, if we're always and everywhere under the gaze of this supernatural being, then we are being reduced to objects, not subjects. And to be human is to be a free, acting subject. And nothing disproves true, hum true humanity like the idea of an omniscient God. And he said, so in order for us to be truly human, we must deny the existence of God. A Dutch philosopher by the name of Leipen responded to that and he said, Sartre says, 
that for us to be free, we have to get rid of God. And so it's our desire for freedom that drives us to deny God. No, said Leipen, it's Sartre's morality that makes the, the denial of God necessary. Because Sartre knew that if there was a God who is holy and who is omniscient, who was looking at him from heaven and making a list and checking it twice, that list was longer than Jean-Paul Sartre ever would want to have to deal with. So we hate him because he knows everything that we do. Before the word is formed on our lips, he knows that ever, whatever we do, we can hide from people, but we can't hide from him. Third thing that we hate about God, said Edwards, was his omnipotence. Because not only is he holy, not only does he know everything about us, but he overpowers us we can't beat him. We can't say our governor can beat your governor to Almighty God, can we? Because he is omnipotent. He has all the powers. When the kings of the earth set themselves against him, aim all of their missiles against heaven, he who sits in the heaven looks down and what? <laughs> he laughs. He holds them in derision. They're powerless against his power. And so you have a holy, omniscient, omnipotent judge before whom you are accountable. And we hate all three of those things. And Edward said, well, there's one other thing that, about God that we really just really despise. What's that? His immutability. I remember the first time I read that in Edwards, you know, I, I was tracking with them the first three. I said, you know, I'd already figured that out. And then Edwards says, well, maybe you're wondering why I include immutability in this list. And I said, yes, yeah, it's exactly what I'm doing. He's wondering why you turn the page. <clears throat> and he said, this is the worst thing about God, is that he's been holy from all eternity up till now. And maybe we think he'll slip up. Maybe like a Shakespearean character, he'll have a fatal blemish that will tarnish his holiness. Maybe like King Uzziah, who ruled for over 52 years, one of the greatest kings in Israel in his old age, sins against God by arrogating to himself the role of the priest and offers the sacrifices himself, and God strikes him with leprosy. Maybe God, someday, will stop being holy. Maybe one day he'll start to grade us on a curve rather than on the basis of his holiness. But Edward says there's no hope of that because God is permanently eternally, immutably holy. Well, what about omniscience? You know, in this world, we see people who are absolutely brilliant. But as they grow old, they start to have senior moments. First, it's sometimers, and later, something worse. And they begin to forget things, memory lapses. And so, since God's called the Ancient of Days, He's older than anybody. Maybe some of that omniscient knowledge that He's accumulated against me, He'll forget. This is another metaphor you'd be careful of. When God forgets our sins, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden there's a loss in His memory bank. That means that He's no longer going to hold them against you. But forever, God will know every sin I've ever committed and every sin you've ever committed. And there's absolutely no hope that he'll stop being omniscient. Well, again, as we age, 
We don't have the strength we used to have. The rhetorical question God asked Moses, has the arm of the Lord waxed short? Suddenly is my arm withered, Moses, that I can't do what I say I'm going to do? Well, maybe we can hope that the older God gets, the weaker he gets, and the weaker he gets, the less we have to fear from his wrath and from his judgment. But Edward says no. Uh Uh-uh. His holiness is an immutable holiness. His omniscience is an immutable omniscience. And his omnipotence is from everlasting to everlasting. That is horrible news to the unrepentant sinner. But it's the best of all possible news to God's redeemed. Could anything worse worse befall us than to have God stop being holy? Would anything be more destructive to us than if God suddenly lost his mind, lost his memory, forgot his promises that he made to our father Abraham and to the church of all ages? Any greater disaster than the Lord God omnipotent who reigns becomes the Lord God impotent who loses? No. The immutability of God is the rock of our souls and the anchor of our faith. Now the text. I've got two minutes left. All that was preface. Why did I choose this text? To eavesdrop on the Apostle Paul at the end of his ministry, at the end of his life, where he's writing to his his beloved student, Timothy. Timothy, I'm rotting in prison here. I'm ready to go. I'm going to be poured out like a drink, Arthur. It's okay. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the course. You know, I've kept the faith. And I'm ready to be an oblation to the Lord. But it's cold where I am. I don't have much to read. Bring me the manuscripts. Bring me my coat, if you would. Try to get here before winter. But you know, the hardest thing, Timothy, right now, from a human perspective, in my valedictorian speech, I'm lonely, and I'm hurt. Because the guys I've worked with, the guys who were co-laborers with me in ministry, the guys who went on the battlefield with me, are gone. Timothy, be diligent to come to me quickly because Demas has forsaken me. You know, one of the things that was a highlight for me today was to see these men in the chaplain's corps who were up in front of us and, and the prayers that we heard for those who have been sent into harm's way. Anyone who's been a soldier in battle knows that every battle brings surprises among the soldiers. Any theologian who's ever been in a controversy knows that every controversy, every issue, brings surprises. The people you counted on 
the people you were sure before the bullets started to fly would be there valiantly flee. And that corporal, that PFC, who you thought was kind of weak in boot camp, is a guy who throws himself on the hand grenade. Isn't that life? Isn't that true? Life's filled with surprises of who stands and who runs. Paul didn't expect Demas to run out on him. Check his name out in the rest of the New Testament, you see that he was a close co-worker with Paul. But Demas has forsaken me. Why? Because he loved this present world, and he's gone. Crescens is gone. Titus is gone. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark. Bring him. Mark, the guy I fired. Bring him back. <laughs> Alexander did me much harm. May the Lord pay him according to his works. Woo. You better beware of him. At my first offense, listen to this, at my first offense, Paul says, no one stood with me. They all forsook me. Same thing that happened to Jesus. And he goes on to say this, may it not be charged against them, but... Here's where the immutability comes in. But the Lord stood with me. My friends left. My co-laborers bailed out. But Jesus showed up in my hour of need because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's why the immutability of God gives us hope and consolation in the darkest dungeons of this world. That's why He is a mighty fortress. That one little word will fell the enemy with His unbridled assaults against us because his word as himself must endure with his kingdom forever. We're going to sing about that. I don't like a lot of repetition in songs, but I like it in the hallelujah chorus because it goes something like this, he shall reign forever and ever and ever, and then how much longer? And ever, <laughs> and ever, and ever. That's the immutability of God and the only proper response of the Christian to that everlasting reign of the King of Kings is hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we change, but Thou changest not. We flee, but Thou standest in the gap. We sin, You remain holy. We forget, You never forget. We become weak. You never lose your strength. For these things, we are grateful. In Jesus' name, amen.